Hey there, and welcome to Indie Wonderful, a collection of the sermons and biblical teachings of Reverend Henry Melton, who pastored what is now called Faith Church in Florence, Alabama for over 40 years. Some know him as Brother Henry, Brother Melton, or Pastor Henry. I'm so honored and grateful to know him as Papa. I'm David Holly, and I'm the oldest grandson of Henry Melton. It's such an honor to preserve these timeless recordings so that Papa's ministry can endure and continue to impact lives for future generations, all to the glory of God. So to you who are willing to hear, listen closely to what God wants to say to you today. Turn tonight to Luke 24. I already read it to you, but I want us to read it out loud together because uh, for just a few minutes tonight, I, I just want to mention some basic Bible principles that guarantee victorious Christian living. I want something that's been tried, don't you? This has been tried in the fiery furnace and the lion's den, and it works. And somebody said, if it's not broke, don't fix it. If it's good enough for Paul, it ought to be good enough for us. Because after all, he wrote half the New Testament. So here in uh, St. Luke 24, I want us to read out loud together. And why don't we just stand? Some of you hadn't stood in 30 minutes. You'll have to go to sleep on me. Are you awake, Dad? You awake? Okay. He's watching me. Dad didn't sleep good last night, so Brother Mac, you keep him awake tonight. Wouldn't that be a crime if me, I put my daddy to sleep while I was preaching? That'd be awful. I never would forgive myself. Luke 24, 49 through 53. Well, let's read it out loud. Here we go. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. You may be seated. God bless his word tonight. His word is already blessed. Now God bless us through his word. Father, use these moments. May every person here be edified and challenged tonight to be all we can be for the glory of God. Now I want to speak for a few minutes tonight on the subject, things they did. As you read the book of Acts and, and the New Testament, it says they, they did this and they did that. Things they did. And I just picked out a few things. There's a whole lot of things they did. Someone has said truth is better caught than taught. An example is worth more than a lot of teaching. How many said amen? I, I got a letter this week from one of our ladies, and uh, she mentioned, and it blessed me, she mentioned two little simple principles that she'd heard me share. And uh, I didn't share these verbally, but I shared these with my lifestyle. And, you know, everything that I hear is not good, but, you know, I, I get a lot of correction, you know, and I need it. I'm open to correction because reproofs of correction are the way of life. And some of our greatest people are our critics. They'll do us good if we don't react and we'll respond the right way. How many said amen? One fellow said, he, don't, he said, I don't care what you say about me, just spell my name right when, the, when you put it in the newspaper. <laughs> but anyway, truth is better caught than taught. You know, uh, I've met some experts on child raising and most of them don't have any children. And, and, someone, and someone has said, don't brag on the job you did with your, your children until you have great, great, great grandchildren because it's not over till it's over. I mean, he said amen. Things, things they did. Here in Luke 24, it says, Jesus told them to go to Jerusalem and tarry. And the Bible says, verse 52, and they worshiped him. Now, I like that. I can't think of anything in the world we can do any greater than worshiping the Lord. Can you? In fact, I've learned that every single aspect of my life is influenced by the way I worship God. 
Everything about my life is based on my attitude in worshiping God. They worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. In other words, they just simply did what Jesus told them to do. Now, isn't that simple? He said to, uh, he said, whatever, mother, the mother of Jesus said, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. Whatever he tells you to do, you do it. You know, there's just something about the human nature. We just don't like to do what we're told to do. And we have to use a lot of time. What is it about us that it's so hard to just simply do what we're told to do? Well, I don't know all the details of it, but I think one problem we have is according to Ephesians 2, it says, wherein in times past, we all walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan, the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience. There's a spirit of disobedience that operates in every person until that person turns their life over to Jesus, repents of their sins, and has God to give them a new nature. And even after you're saved, you still have a few problems. Don't ask me how I know this. But even after you're saved, you still have problems doing what you're told to do because the old nature isn't completely eradicated the moment you got saved, unfortunately. Not many of us were born crucified <laughs> and to try to find another way. You know, even in the book, is it Jeremiah, where it says, you know, that there was a cistern of living water and they hewed themselves out cisterns of their own, broken cisterns that could hold no water. They, dis, they were determined to find another way than the way God told them to do it. Remember that time David decided to take the ark back to Jerusalem because the glory of God and the presence of God had departed from Jerusalem because the ark was gone. God followed that ark. That ark represented God's presence. And so the ark was taken, and David, he decided to, when he became king to take that ark back to Jerusalem and get the presence of God back into Jerusalem, God's holy city. And so he got some men to build a brand new cart and to put that Ark of the Covenant on that cart. And on their way they were going to Jerusalem. But of course, something always happens when you don't do it God's way. And the wheel of the cart hit a rock and the, the cart began to jostle up and down. And uh, the Ark was about to fall off that cart. And what was his name? Uzzah, Uzzah, something like that. He thought, hmm, this thing's going to fall to the ground. I've got to do something about it. And he touched that ark. De he's dead. And so David got the news that uh, they hadn't gone far until the man's died. And so he realizes something's wrong. He said, hold everything. Leave that cart right there. Leave that ark right there. Let's get in the book and see what we've done wrong. And then they found out that only the priest was to carry the ark. No new cart was to carry that ark. And ever since the uh, man has been created, he's been trying to do it some other way. He sowed fig leaves in the garden, you know, fig leaves. I thought that would suffice, but how many knows that doesn't hide you, that doesn't hide your sinfulness from God. And so they just simply did what the Lord told them to do. Look here in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. Here's something else they did. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Isn't that beautiful? They were told to go to the upper room and tarry. And they had, I'm guessing, about a nine-day prayer meeting. Young people, I cannot think of anything in this world more exciting than being saved from your sins, being born again, and then being filled with the precious Holy Ghost. June the 10th, 1957, in Jacksonville, Alabama, about 10 o'clock one night, I was worshiping the Lord in, in the Church of God, a church, their headquarters is in Cleveland, Tennessee. And oh my, about 10 o'clock that night, the glory came down and heaven filled my soul. Heaven kissed the earth and I got caught in a smack. I'll tell you folks, it was the sweetest experience since I'd gotten saved. Such a sweet experience to be filled, to be baptized, to be immersed with the power 
of the Holy Ghost. Nothing like it. Nothing like it. It's wonderful. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. Now, I'm getting on a controversy right now. Somebody said, do I have to speak in tongues? No, no. A thousand times no. You get to. You don't have to. It's not an obligation. It's not a duty. You're just as much on your way to heaven before you speak in tongues, but my, 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 my. Let me give you a few scriptures on that. I'm not gonna, we don't do a lot of preaching. Now. I don't think you've ever heard me preach on tongues around here. I don't preach on tongues. I just don't do it. I don't major on, on gifts. I major on Jesus. But by the way, when you buy a pair of shoes, the tongues come with it. <laughs> and shoes that don't have a tongue are called loafers. Well, <laughs> but anyway, let me look here. 1 Corinthians 14. Look at 1 Corinthians. Hold your place there. I'm going to stay in Acts for a while. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 2. Let's just look at what the Bible says. Well, you know, all that jabbering, all that jabbering. Tongues are of the devil. Didn't you know that, preacher? Heard about these two men when they were intoxicated. They went into this church, and there was a message in tongues going out, and one of them said to the other, let's get out of here. This is of the devil. The other one said, why ain't we got it then? <laughs> We've got everything else he's got. Why ain't we got it? <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 14. Well, let's go on. First Corinthians chapter 14. Let's look at verse 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. Hey, that's not all that bad, is it? Talking to God can't be all that bad. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue, he's not talking to men but he's talking to God. No man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries or divine secrets. Look at verse four. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself. Now that's not all that bad. To edify means to build yourself up. How many's ever had a language where it, and it built you up? Let's see, yeah, you ever been built up? It edifies, it builds you up. Speaking in tongues is to the spirit what weightlifting is to the physical. Weightlifting builds you up physically. Talking to God in the spirit builds you up spiritually. That's what our Bible said. And by the way, didn't the Bible tell us here in verse 2 of Acts 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven? Oh, it didn't say this came from hell. <laughs> And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. This wasn't the devil working. This was God working. Let me give you another verse on that. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 5. I would that ye all spake with tongues. Hmm. Who is this talking? Some religious nut? Some emotional Pentecostal? No, this is a man that wrote half the New Testament. and A very educated man. This is the Apostle Paul, the greatest preacher in the New Testament besides Jesus. I would that you all spake with tongues. Look at verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 14. Verse 18. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 18, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Hey, what kind of man is this preacher Paul? Goes around talking in tongues more than everybody else. Hmm. Boy, he must have a reason. Now let's look at one more verse. Look at verse 39 of 1 Corinthians 14. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not. Oh, I'll tell you, there's some theologians need to read this verse. It says, forbid not to speak in tongues. Does your Bible say that? You're getting mighty quiet on me. Forbid not to speak in tongues. Well, things they did. This was a church that was empowered with the presence and power of God. Do we want the power of God in our life? If we do, then I think we ought to want all that God has for us. And what's so bad about being edified? And what's so bad about receiving what the Lord gives? They were all filled. I pray tonight. I, I can't think of anything greater for young people. My, my. Young people like a challenge. 
They were like a challenge. I remember when I was a boy, I was a young fellow about 11, 12 years old, went to Brandon School till I was 12 years old. Then I graduated from the sixth grade and went to Coffey Junior High School. But I was about 12 years old and we walked back then. We didn't ride cars. There wasn't many cars to ride. And uh, we walked to school and walked home and several of us boys, we'd walk home and there was a big, there was a high trestle. There was a trestle, train track trestle. Uh, real high, just a few blocks from Brandon School on our way through Sweetwater up over to Cherry Hill. And I remember uh, the guys would challenge each other to jump off that trestle. They'd challenge us to uh, see who would jump from the highest point. Now then they don't, they're not doing things like that. They get in their cars and say, I, you get down there and I'll get up here and we're going to head to each other right in the middle of the road. And the guys yell, he's a coward, the guy that moves over. Of course, sometimes they get killed, don't they? I remember one time a guy accepted a challenge and he jumped right in the middle. It had been raining a whole lot in East Florence and the waters were muddy and the waters were up and this guy challenged us to jump out there in the middle of that water. And we did and one guy got his feet cut almost in two pieces, almost in two pieces. Blood was going everywhere. I remember when I was playing baseball up here at UNA, I was out there practicing after a big rain one afternoon and it was out in the outfield and they, they, I was a pitcher and they made us pitchers do a lot of running until our tongue hung out so we'd be in good shape, could last the whole game. And I was out there catching flies and running and one of the guys, there's a big mud puddle out there and he said, I, I dare you to run through it. Just dive through that mud puddle head first and he said, he said, if you do it, I'll do it. I just took off and just head first dove through that mud puddle. Oh, I'll tell you, mud, I, I, you couldn't see me for mud. He wasn't one of those beauty bass either. Amen. And that guy, he, he, he was yellow. He was a coward. He wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. Amen. But oh my, I want to stand up here tonight and I want to challenge, especially the young people. If you really want to get into something exciting, if you really want a thrill out of life, you let Jesus have your life. You repent of your sins. You humble yourself and let him come into your life and you seek him. You seek him till he fills you with, with the Holy Ghost and fire. It'll change your life and your life will become exciting. You'll see God work in your behalf. You'll see God move in your behalf. Oh yeah, you'll be persecuted. They'll call you a sanctified sailor, or jolly John. But that's all right. Amen. Let me mention something else they did. Acts chapter uh, 2 and verse 41. Acts 2 and verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added to them about 3,000 souls. Did you hear that? After the 120 was gloriously filled with the Holy Spirit of God on the day of Pentecost, they lost their bashfulness. They lost their pride. They began to go out and witness, and 3,000, 3,000 were, were converted just a few days after the day of Pentecost. They that received the word were baptized. Let me see, how many of you have followed the Lord in water baptism? You've buried the old man. Oh, wonderful. I heard this one preacher. No, no, I, this is not, I'm just quoting him. He said, listen, when you get saved and you die out to sin, bury the old man before he gets to stinking. <laughs> Amen. I believe it's very scriptural to follow the Lord in water baptism. I believe, I believe it's more than getting wet. I believe more will happen to you than just getting wet. The Bible says when Jesus was baptized, heaven was opened and the Holy Ghost descended upon him like a dove. In Acts 2.38, he said, Repent and be baptized, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and your children, to those that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. I, I always enjoy water baptism because you, when I baptize someone, without exception, I don't think I've ever baptized a, a person in water but what? The Holy Spirit came into that water. The Holy Spirit came upon us in a very, very, very special way. I want to encourage you. Follow your Lord in water baptism. If you've repented of your sins, it's time to bear the old man. How many said amen? Now look at verse 42, Acts 2, 42. 
This is one of the key verses of the Bible, a VIP. Four basics here. Now, we all know that the four basics in education is reading, writing, arithmetic, and recess. We, we all, everybody knows that. Reading, writing, arithmetic, and recess. Amen? And so, here are four basics in the Christian life. Let's look at them. And they continued steadfastly, I like that word, steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Notice, these are four cardinal VIP, very important principles for the believer, for the Christian. I trust that you're doing all four of them. They continued steadfastly in the Word of God. The apostles' doctrine means the teachings of Jesus, the Word of God. I cannot overemphasize the importance of you getting in the Word and letting the Word get in you. I cannot. Now, let me I want to be real sweet tonight. I want to be a real sweet. How many things have been sweet so far? Okay. I want to be real sweet. But for the life, I cannot understand why grown people don't come to Sunday school. I cannot understand why some of our people yet don't sense the importance of getting their children in family Bible hour. I want to be real sweet tonight. But folks, we have about 125 that come to the early service. And we have about 600, I'm just guessing, come to the second service. And did you know we don't have over 300 in Family Bible Hour? I do not believe a church can be a great church if we don't love the Word of God. Those Baptists over Muscle Shows, the moment you come to their church and get saved, they enroll you in a Sunday school class. They got six and seven, eight hundred in Sunday school. I've heard about those folks over there. They're doing something right. I'm going to start enrolling you folks. <laughs> Don't shout me down. I'm preaching good tonight. How many said amen? Amen. Proverbs 4.20. Let me give you a verse on that. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 20. Proverbs 4 verse 20. My son. Attend to my words. What does that mean to attend to my words? That means give, give my words your attention. Incline your ears to my saying. Let them not depart from thy eyes. Keep them in the midst of thy heart. For they are life to those that find them and their health, health or medicine to all their flesh. Wow. Did you know folks that get in the Word are healthier people? Did you know it'll make you healthy? The Word is the gospel. <laughs> the Word is the gospel. He sent His Word and healed them. How many ever heard of Derek Prince? Now, his wife's in heaven tonight, and he's remarried, I understand. But his first wife, married to her for about 40, 45 years or more, and he told this in one of his messages. He said, when my wife gets sick, she goes to bed with T.L. Osborne's book, Healing the Sick. And all that book is is just full of scriptures on healing. A friend of mine was reading that book, and uh, they had stuck a needle in his spine, and, and, the, and the nerves in his spine were unraveling like a rope. And uh, they told him in a few months or a year or two, he'd lose con complete control of his body and he'd be jerking all over. And he had gotten saved. The Lord called him to preach. His name was Don Cooley. I, I saw him the other day. He lived out on, on Cobber in Cobbert Heights. And I gave him a copy of that book, Healing the Sick. He called me one day. He called me one day. I've never heard a man more exciting. He said, I've been in this book. And he said, while I was reading it, the word got, got in my heart. And he said, all of a sudden, it came into my consciousness. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. He said, preacher, I've been trying to call you for 30 minutes, but I've been so happy. I've been shouting. I've been shouting, and I've discovered that I'm healed. Just got in the Word. I'm healed. I'm healed. 
And as far as I know, that has never, he had some other sicknesses since him, that that's never come back on him. George Sandy's wife, Ruth, had cancer. And she began to meditate upon Mark 11, 24. Whatever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive it and you shall have it. If you say of this mountain, be removed and cast in the sea. Don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say comes to pass. You'll have whatever you say. She said, Lord, that's your word. I believe it up here, but how do I get it from my head to my heart? And the Lord impressed her, meditate upon it till it becomes a part of you. And she said, I don't know how long I meditated upon those two verses. She said, I don't know how long I did. Maybe it was hours. She said, I don't know how long it was. But it came into her consciousness that she was healed. She told her doctor, he smiled, went and read the x-rays, came back and said, you're right. And she went home the next day. My, my. In Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16, thy words were found and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. David said, blessed is a man that meditates upon the law of the Lord day and night. Wow. Powerful. Let's look at this second principle in Acts 2, 42. The word and then fellowship. Fellowship. I believe it's vital. It's vital. What was that young girl's name that was enrolling in this all men's college? Anybody remember her name? And you know, she still says it wasn't her physical condition that got her, that defeated her. She still says she looks strong. She said, it was not my inability to do the exercises along with the men that caused me to re resign. She said, I was so affected mentally. She said, I didn't have any friends. Everybody was against her. I'm going to tell you something. What would it be like to not have one friend? What would it be like to not have one person that you could fellowship with? Wow, I don't want to know what it's like. I said, I don't know, want to know what it's like. Fellowship. That's why that uh, Brother Robert Kidd is working countless hours. We're getting together some home groups to start in the next few weeks. I trust that you'll get enrolled in a home group. That 2020 vision, Acts 2020, Paul said, I taught you publicly and from house to house. And we're just trying to incorporate the scripture to fit our needs. We, we're not going to do it like Dr. Cho. We're not going to copy somebody else. But we're just going to, we believe that every member of our church ought to be involved in a small group. Every member of our church ought to be involved in at least one small group setting to have that fellowship to draw strength from each other. And I agree that in a, in a crowd like this, you can't have that fellowship in small groups, five and 10, 15. We need that. How many say we need that? Amen. Fellowship. Look at verse 42. And in breaking of bread, you're going to like this one? Eating together. <laughs> eating together. Did you know that's one of the principles of the Bible, Christians eating together? But we do good there, don't we? All, some of you are already thinking about Shoney's right now. Amen. Or Newburn's. <laughs> Come on, preacher, Newburn's closed at 815. <laughs> amen, amen. Fellowship, eating together. There's great spiritual blessings by just eating together. We're going to do it tomorrow at 1130. You come on around. And then look at the fourth principle, and in prayers, and in prayers. Jesus said men ought always to pray and not to faint. Always to pray and not to faint. Now then look at uh, Acts 2.46. I want to show you something else they did. It's full of it. Acts 2.46. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. There it is. Did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They had unity. They had unity. Have you ever noticed? Have you ever noticed that just don't take a whole lot of effort to say something negative about somebody? Have you ever noticed how easy it is to think a negative thought about somebody else? 
It, it, it don't take any effort. Why don't it? Because we inherited that ability from Adam and Eve. Hmm. But we have to get a brand new mind, have our mind renewed to think positively, think good thoughts about each other. Amen. That's why the Bible gives us, the sp Christians, a space of repentance. When we talk about each other, gossip and, and be negative about each other. Hmm. And you know, the devil works overtime trying to get us at outs with each other. Do you know that? Yes, sir. He works overtime. I was over, I was over in, in Georgia preaching revival many years ago for my, for my brother-in-law, Clara's brother, who's a preacher. And he and I were riding down the road one day, and he said, see that church over there? Yeah. He said, see those tables where, where they ate outside these all-day dinners? Yeah. He said, that church split over an all-day dinner. I said, it did. I said, what happened? He said two of the men were, were, they were, they were out in the yard. Everybody was eating their fried chicken, and all their vegetables and everything. And this guy had a, had a drumstick in his hand, a chicken leg. He said, just think about it. Millions of years ago, my heavenly father knew that this day I'd be eating this chicken leg. The other fellow grabbed it out of his hand and ate it himself said, no, he didn't. Either. They got in a fight and split the church over a chicken leg. I said, I said, Brother Kirby, did that actually happen? He said, yes, sir, that happened, that happened. You'd be surprised. Boy, that devil, he don't care whether it's a toothpick or a chicken leg, does he? He don't care. He just don't want you to have a, agreement and unity. He don't want us to have unity. I believe he's kind of mad about the Muscle Shoals area. We dismiss church and go down to the Magnolia Church of Christ. The old devil, he's just scratching his head. I don't think he's got any hair, but, but he's just scratching his head, I'll tell you. He's just scratching his head. I'll tell you, he just can't understand it. And we go down there and have a good time. They asked me to do, give a devotional, ask Brother Gene to read some scripture. And, and we have a good time, and, and church is over, and they have prepared refreshments for us. And I get so excited, I don't want any Cokes, I don't want any candy, I don't want any co cookies, I, don't, I just want to talk, I want a fellowship. And I don't want to come home. I, I told Brother Joe, I said, Joe, I don't want to go home. It's after 10 o'clock, I didn't want to come home. I was enjoying myself. The devil just defeated, just defeated. Hallelujah. And we went over to the Coliseum. 2,500 packed the Coliseum on a hot day, no air conditioning over and nobody wanted to leave. Two hours. Ah, can you just say the old devil? <laughs> amen, amen, amen. He ain't seen nothing yet. I believe Joe Van Dyke's right. I believe we're going to fill Brawley Stadium. Yes, sir, I believe that. Amen, amen, amen. Unit, it's coming. It's coming. And then, let me give you another one. It's found in, uh, well, uh, before I get off of that, I've got to give you one more verse, one more scripture. Hold your place there, and I want you to turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. I want to talk to the wives a little bit first. Will you let me talk to you a little bit, wives? And then I want to talk to the husbands. And I'm going to use, here's two words, likewise, likewise. Look at verse 1, likewise. Look at verse 7, likewise. First of all, look at verse 1. 1 Peter 3, 1. You wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. I, I'm, I'm going to read fast. And if any obey not the word, but may also without the word be won by the lifestyle or the conversation of the wife. What a promise. While they behold your chaste conversation, it's not what you say, it's what they see. They behold it, they don't hear it. Coupled with fear. Who's adorning? Let it not be the outward adorning of plaiting the hair, the wearing of gold, the putting on of beautiful clothes. That's good. But let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves with that meek and quiet spirit, 
being in subjection to their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham and called him Lord. I like that. I read that this afternoon. I really like that. Now, she might not call you Lord, but you might not want to call him Lord, but you could at least say sweetie pie or something like that. Whose daughters ye are as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Have a, a, a meek and quiet spirit. And then ye husbands, likewise ye husbands, dwell with your wife according to knowledge. This just simply means it's an intelligent recognition of your marriage vows that you'll love her and honor and keep her. Giving honor to your wife as the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. And I think one of the greatest things we can do is, is pray with our wife or our husband. Pray together because we're heirs together. Notice, we're heirs together. What happens when a man and his wife don't get along? They're all time, there's got friction, you know. Uh, resentment, oh brother, resentment takes time. Did you know that resentment is hatred in diapers? You let resentment grow up and it'll become hatred. Resentment is hatred in diapers. You keep resenting and after a while you start hating. It may take a while. It may, be, it may become bitterness first, but it'll become bitterness and then hatred. So dwell with your wives according to knowledge because you're heirs together, that togetherness. We need that togetherness. And the devil works overtime to cause companions not to get along with each other. But we need that unity in our homes, don't we? Okay, let me give you a couple more quickly. Look in the book of Acts, and I've already forgotten, I believe it's chapter 8. I didn't write it down. I'm going to have to guess. Acts chapter 8. Acts, I, I believe it's Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. There was a persecution. And in Acts chapter 8 verse 4, Therefore... They that were scattered abroad because of persecution, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. I remember when I was growing up, every member of the church was bold to proclaim Jesus. Everybody didn't preach behind a pulpit. They didn't open their Bible and take a text. But it seemed like everybody was preachers. And this word preacher means sharing, heralding, proclaiming. That's all it means. Preaching just simply means that you just tell somebody what the Lord's done for you. Let me see your hands. Has the Lord done something good for you? Let me see your hand if he's done something good. Raise your hand real high. Well, you've got something to tell. Did you know almost everybody enjoy a personal story about your personal life? I've never given my little old simple testimony. Now, I can't say I was delivered from drugs and, and God instantly set me free and, and I was a member of the mafia. <laughs> I can't say all that. All I can say is, and, and, and it don't seem to bore folks. I just tell them I was a PK. I was a preacher's kid. I had to be sneaking when I was growing up. And, or daddy would have half killed me if he'd have caught up with me and I was sneaking and I got by with a few things and I was sneaking and, and I'll never forget how that uh, I went to college and, and my senior year of college, uh, my daddy was down in Florida building a brand new church and uh, my mother, she was staying with her two boys because she, wanted, she didn't want her boys to be alone while they were in school. She want, and her husband gave her permission to stay with her boys and, and uh, my senior year in college about Christmas time, my daddy got lonesome to see his wife and his children and, and he told the ch little church in Florida that he was uh, uh, founding down there that he needed a hundred dollars and in five minutes he had a hundred dollars and he mail that hundred dollars to us and we got in a green Hudson Hornet and we drove to Florida and on Thursday night <laughs> on Thursday night my dad was preaching and all of a sudden Jesus revealed himself to me and before I realized what I was doing I was on my feet and walked up to the front of that little three room building and I knelt at a little wore out ottoman and gave my life to Jesus <laughs> that's all I got to tell but my you ought to see them. they get excited I tell them they get excited and I said, the same thing can happen to you. Now, if you've had a personal experience with Jesus, it won't be like mine. It's not supposed to be. 
But if you've met the Lord and he's come into your life, you've got something to tell. You can herald and proclaim and share Jesus with somebody. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. It's exciting. It's wonderful. I was in the hospital and I met a former fellow that I used to play baseball against here in Florence, Alabama. I said, don't I know you? I was walking down the hall, looked in. I said, don't I know you? He says, you look familiar too. I said, well, I'm, I'm H. Melton. Used to play ball in this county league. He said, I played for Central. He said, my name is J.I. Fowler. I, I sell auto parts. I said, uh, I'm glad to see you, J.I. How you doing? Oh, he said, I've had a nervous breakdown. He said, my son, 18 years old, just suddenly died and He's just got the best of me, and I've become an alcoholic, and I've had a nervous breakdown. I said, well, J.I., could I have a prayer with you? He said, well, sure. I prayed for him. Don't remember a word I said. I just prayed for him. I left. The next morning, my telephone rung, and his, sis, his brother, her brother, Bud, Bud Lumpkins, called me and said, hey, I said, uh, J.I. wants to see you. J.I. wants to see me? He said, yeah, he wants to see you. So I went up to the hospital, walked in his room. He grabbed me. He just grabbed me and squeezed me real good and hugged me. He said, your prayer done it. I said, what did my prayer do? He said, uh, after you left, he said, I was getting ready to, for bed and took my sleeping pill and couldn't go to sleep. Walked down the hall, walked back, exercised, and laid down, couldn't go to sleep. He said, a little voice said to me, if you get on your knees and pray, let Jesus come into your heart, you'll be all right. He said, you know, I did that. I said, you'll be going home soon. He said, yeah, I'm going home today. He said, I'm all right. My, 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 my. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. They went everywhere. They were scattered abroad, and they went everywhere. Oh, God, help us to go everywhere. Share the good news of what Jesus has done for us. My, my, my. One more thing. Look at Acts 13. I'm through. Acts 13. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work I've called them to do. Here's three more things they did, and I'm closing. They ministered to the Lord. I cannot tell you how precious and how exciting and how wonderful and how thrilling it is to get off, just get off to yourself and just start loving Jesus. Just get off to yourself and sit down somewhere Get a song on your mind. Just sing a little song to the Lord. And then just start thanking Him for everything He's done for you. And then just start praising Him for being your Father. Thank Him for what He's done. Then just start praising Him for what He's done for you. And if you don't leave there, exciting and happy, I'll give you your money back. Because you'll be, you'll be so excited, you'll be so thrilled, and you'll be so happy ministering to the Lord. Did you know you can bless the Lord? You can minister to the Lord? That's what they were doing in, in Luke 24. They were continually praising and blessing God. I can bless God? Yes! But when you bless God, guess what happens? He blesses you. He blesses you. They ministered to the Lord and they fasted. There's a few folks been fasting around here. I can already tell a difference. I want us to keep it up. What is it? Uh, Isaiah 58 and 6. Is not this the fast I've chosen, saith the Lord? To break, to break the bands of wickedness. To let the oppressed go free. To undo every burden. To break the yoke. Fasting breaks the bands of wickedness. Fasting does things inside of us that are so valuable. Fasting changes us. 
Fasting causes the old carnal nature and the natural man to, get, to fall out of the picture. And it causes the spiritual part of us to rise up and take over in our life. You know, up until just a few weeks ago, until I started missing a few more meals, I did not realize how attached I had become to this natural world. And I'm going to tell you something. It hasn't been easy for me to get detached. I'm not talking about committing sin. I'm just talking about living detached from things, from the cares of this life. I didn't realize how wrapped up I am in temporal relationships and temporal things. Brother. But I'll tell you one thing. As we humble ourselves through fasting, we're in for a great spiritual uprising in the church, in our own personal lives. I've experienced more peace these last three or four weeks since you and I have been sharing together. And I hadn't, I hadn't gotten completely free or completely detached, but I'm on my way. I said, I'm on my way. I made a mistake. Uh, when was it? I made a mistake uh, Saturday. I made a mistake Saturday, and, and uh, uh, I, I'd miss some meals and... and uh, and I, I had a, a wedding to perform here Saturday afternoon. And uh, before I realized it, I had, you know, I, had, I, I just wasn't thinking properly. I just wasn't thinking properly. And I almost missed it right in the middle of that wedding. I, I, just, I just forgot to, what I was supposed to do next. But then uh, it finally came to me. I like to miss it. But the Lord helped me. Now, they fasted. They worshiped. And then let's look at the last one here. They released men to ministry. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said. That's what we need. We need for the Holy Ghost to say some things. We need for the Holy Ghost to begin to speak to the church. I need, the, and you need the Holy Ghost to begin to speak to you. That's what that experience in God's all about. Brother Jim may not know this, but we're in the process of asking Brother Jim to come to our church and teach a group of people, if he has the time, this fall. Because we believe that the most valuable things you can do for God are the things that the Holy Spirit tells you to do. How many understands that? The most valuable things we can do are things the Holy Spirit tells us to do. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul and when they had fasted and prayed they laid their hands on them and they sent them away and being sent forth by the Holy Ghost they went out and they released these men to ministry that's what we're doing for Greg and, Greg and Anna we're releasing them to go back to Mexico in September from our church how wonderful to have a couple that we can just pray over and, and, and send them to Mexico representing Faith Tabernacle in the country of Mexico. Well, I'll just mention a few things that they did. I'm going to ask our musicians to come. Now, really, to be real honest with you, I don't really know how to close this service except to say this. Whatever he tells you to do tonight, you do it. If you're here and the Lord tells you that you need to accept Jesus in your heart. If the Lord tells you that you need to humble yourself and repent of something in your life, do what he tells you to do. Don't argue. Just do it. Just do it. Things they did. If the Lord tells you that you just need to come up here and spend a few minutes letting the sweet Spirit of God just fill you to overflowing, just fill your life with His grace and His glory and His power and His anointing, a fresh anointing of, of God upon your life. Whatever He tells you to do, you do it. The Lord may instruct you to go to somebody. He may show you somebody that's hurting. You may want to pray with somebody during this time. But for the next five or ten minutes, I think we ought to just, whatever He tells us to do, let's do it. Now, I want to challenge us tonight to respond to the Lord and, and just do what He tells you to do tonight. And you'll be blessed. And you'll be a blessing. And others will be blessed. 
I want to challenge every, especially, I don't know why I felt this afternoon that I ought to challenge young people. I especially want to challenge young people. I remember several years ago, I was preaching a, a youth camp over in Georgia. Brother Hyman's young people uh, went with us over there. I went with their group over there, and I was preaching for Brother Eugene Holder from Meredith, Georgia, Crawfordsville, Georgia. And one night in an open air service, I'd gotten through preaching. We had a great altar call. The altars were filled with young people seeking God. I love youth camps. And Brother Hyman's son, Nathan, good boy, real timid and bashful. Couldn't get him to say half a dozen words when you talk to him. And, and the Holy Spirit got a hold of Nathan. And oh, he was being filled with the Holy Spirit. He was more emotional than I'd ever seen him before in my life. Just got to jumping up and down, the Holy Spirit all over him. I mean, the Spirit of God had taken over, just taken him completely over, body, soul, mind, and spirit. And the Spirit of God was moving mightily in his life. And Brother Hyman whispered to me and said, Brother Henry, Nathan needs that. He needs that about once a week. He needs a good dose of that about once a week. My, what if every teenager had a good dose of the Holy Ghost about once a week? Well, once a day wouldn't be too bad, would it? Amen. I want to challenge young people to submit your life to the Lord. And if you haven't accepted Jesus in your life, do that. Then let God fill you with his precious spirit. My, my, my. It's, it's great. Nothing like it. Let's stand together. And whatever he tells you to do, some of you may want to come up here and talk to the Lord about a, about a revival in the Muscle Shoals area, a revival in your heart. Feel free to come. I'm going to ask the young people that will to meet me up here. And let's have a, just a time of praying and seeking God. How many of you young people will accept my challenge tonight? Just come right on up here. Let's spend some time with the Lord tonight. Let God have his Thank you for listening to this powerful message. And I pray you would allow the word you receive today to produce great things in your life. If you're listening on an audio podcast platform, be sure to leave a comment and give my papa a five-star rating. If you're watching or listening on YouTube, be sure to like, subscribe, click the notification bell, and share your thoughts and any prayer requests you may have in the comment section. Finally, help us continue to spread the Word of God by sharing this recording with someone else today. May God bless you greatly. Isn't he wonderful?